Good morning and welcome to worship here at the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. We are so glad that you could join us in praising God this morning. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship. Praise the Lord in the great congregation. We lift up our vows before those who fear God. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before God. We will tell future generations about the Lord. And they will proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn. Please join me in the prayer of confession followed by a moment of silent prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not been sincere Christians. We claim to follow Jesus, but we have not taken his path of sacrificial love. We profess to be disciples, but we are not willing to bear the cost of discipleship. We affirm the virtue of self-denial, but we indulge our selfish desires and seek earthly gain. Our faithfulness has been too narrow, too focused on human things. Forgive us, we pray, and wash us in your mercy. Free us for sincere repentance so we may try again. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. God deems as righteous all who trust that Jesus has been raised for our salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Last week, we talked about the season of Lent, and we talked about doing something every day that would make somebody happy. Well, we're all tempted to do things that make ourselves happy, right? Things that we like to do, we like to get our own way, we like to keep all of our toys just for ourselves, but that's not how Jesus wants us to live. Jesus said that we're supposed to think about other people besides ourselves all the time, and we need to think of other people and things that will make them happy. So helping others, sharing our toys, being nice, are things that we can do to show our faithfulness to God. Jesus teaches us this, and I know that you are all really fast learners. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for teaching us the best way to live. 
Help us to remember to follow Jesus because we know that by doing that, we will make you happy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word, reveal to us the good news, and enable us to trust in the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. God's promise realized through faith. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into the existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what he said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but all, for ours also. It will be reckoned with to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Lent is designed to be a season of self-discipline, fasting, and intense contemplation of the human condition. Lent brings us to the mat and makes us wrestle with mortality, suffering, and sin so that we recognize how deeply we need God's saving grace and so that by contrast, we can fully experience the joy and dramatic release of the Easter miracle. Lent hands us challenging scripture passages like this one from Mark. Laden as it is with rebuke, a loyal disciple branded as Satan, cross-bearing, suffering, self-denial, and death. Faithfulness doesn't come cheaply during Lent. And I would guess that we're already sort of tired of Lent 
We've been living it for the last year, after all, and not just because we entered a bizarre time warp during Lent 2020, from which we have yet to emerge. We've felt our own vulnerability and mortality on a daily basis in a way very few of us have ever experienced before. This week, we surpassed half a million COVID deaths here in the United States. And in just two weeks this month, we also lost three longtime members of our own congregation to the virus. That's a lot of death. We've experienced and seen much suffering, isolation and fasting from human touch, joblessness, hunger, a sharp rise in addiction, mental illness, and suicide. And we've witnessed our collective sinfulness on brazen display. A handful of billionaires raking in fresh billions as millions of others lose everything. Our black brothers and sisters dying at disproportionate rates from this virus because of the effects of systemic racism. Violence stalking our streets and our capital, and even now, a vaccination scheduling system that heavily privileges those who, thanks to their age and financial resources, have ready access to technology and the time and skill to leverage it. It has been a hard year, and I know we're weary of talking about it. We might prefer to just skip this whole lenty, cross-bearing thing in today's scripture. But here we are. Here we are with our friend Peter, who starts out by showing, of all things, how much we humans resist those things that make us uncomfortable. When Jesus is all about the miracles, the healings, the restoration, the feeding of thousands, Peter is right there with him until he can confidently and joyously proclaim Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. But the instant Jesus talks of his suffering, rejection, and death, Peter snaps to resistance and rebuke. No, 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 no. Stop talking like that, Jesus. Don't be so negative. Stop being such a downer. Peter shies away. Faithfulness shouldn't ask so much. We shy away. Faithfulness shouldn't be so hard and uncomfortable. I can't tell you the number of times I've been told by all kinds of people in all kinds of different contexts that church isn't supposed to make us uncomfortable. We spend all week out there with all the ugly mess. So in here, we only want a warm, soothing, comforting escape. And I get it. I really do. Life is too much. We all need a safe space to get off the ride and rest for a while. But Jesus doesn't let Peter wriggle away from the discomfort, and he doesn't allow us to either. Instead, he puts it front and center essential to the life of faithfulness to him. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. We've heard these words so many times, 
they're liable to roll right off us. Or maybe we even write them off because they've been used too frequently to promote oppressive suffering that isn't of God. But every time we hear these words, Jesus invites us, challenges us to weigh once again the true cost and true reward of discipleship. To follow Jesus is to take on discomfort, suffering even, for the sake of something greater. Jesus ends up carrying a cross because of his dogged determination to bring near the kingdom of God, to heal the untouchables, to restore the ostracized, to bring the broken in contact with the divine, all in direct challenge to the many, many forces that wanted to keep those people exactly where they were. Likewise, if we want to follow Jesus faithfully, we don't get to escape from the ugly challenge of the world. Rather, we have to walk straight into it. Faithfulness requires a certain spiritual muscle that keeps us present when we'd much rather run away from the negative hard stuff. If we're not actually present, we can't actually do ministry after all. To follow Jesus wherever he leads means we have to learn to lean in to our discomfort. Instead of trying to escape into human things like Peter did. And we certainly have a stunning array of human things at our disposal to dull the pain and avoid the discomfort. Maybe one of the bizarre spiritual gifts of this last year has been the sheer inescapability of it all. There's been ample opportunity to exercise that muscle. Indeed, we've had little choice but to be present with all the negative, hard stuff. This year has been boot camp for the building blocks of faithfulness. That is, of course, if this year hasn't broken us. And it certainly has pushed many, many people far past their limits. But that brings me to the powerful hope and good news within Jesus's hard lesson. First, the weight of faithfulness, the burden of the cross, is not one we bear alone. We hold it together. After all, even Jesus had some help bearing his cross Along part of the road to Golgotha, Simon of Cyrene carried that weight with him. There are times in each of our lives when we're simply unable to hold faith and hope ourselves. We're too sick, too depressed, too depleted, or now too overwhelmed by pandemic life. A wise friend, pastor and woman of faith once told me during an especially difficult season of my life, don't worry, I'll hold the hope for you until you're able to pick it up again yourself. This is one of the greatest gifts we give to one another as a community. Trading off, holding the faith and hope in the midst of the hard stuff of life. Like so many things, this pandemic has made this sharing harder to do and harder to experience. We don't get to see one another, to hold one another's hands, to encourage one another in person. We've done an admirable job of staying connected through technology, but I think we're all still struggling anyway with feeling isolated from one another. I know I am. This year, we've learned in a palpable way just how important community is to the exercise of faithfulness. 
And the good news is we are still here. We are still here for one another. Jesus also makes it clear that the demanding faithfulness he asks comes with a powerful upside. When we pursue the gospel, when we act according to Jesus's priorities, when we seek healing, restoration, and justice for the last and the least, we may encounter discomfort and cross-bearing struggle, but we also find life for our very souls, abundant life. Christian history is filled with examples of this paradox. People filled with an inner joy and peace even as they confront horrific circumstances for the sake of the gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was such a person. He was someone that others loved to be around because of the joy he had. And it's said that he even befriended the Nazi guards who imprisoned him before they handed him over for execution. But we don't have to look to just the spiritual greats to find evidence of this life Jesus describes. We've probably all known someone who exudes an inexplicable grace and peace in the face of life's trials. And I'd say we've all tasted, at least a few times, the joy and peace that come from working in concert with the kingdom whether it's been when we learn a new way to address injustice, or we serve one another, or we take a public stand for someone who is oppressed. As we journey through our church season of Lent, through the ongoing Lent of this pandemic, and through the Lent which will persist even when the virus eventually abates, there is such a need for us to practice the kind of faithfulness Jesus asks in this passage. There is such a need for us to lay aside our desire for escape and comfort and to instead shoulder the cross and do the work of the kingdom. Maybe that will look like joining the group of community leaders currently talking with the new Morris County prosecutor, Robert Carroll, about how he will address the egregious racial disparities within our own local justice system. Maybe it will look like coming to put pressure on our governor, our legislature, and our judiciary to actually talk and develop a comprehensive plan to address the tsunami of evictions and homelessness that looms. Maybe it will look like deepening our personal anti-racism work, including the raw self-examination that helps us to see how we can be good people and deeply embedded in racism at the same time. Maybe it will look like expanding the reach and impact of our clothing bank. Maybe it will look like many other things. But however it looks, Jesus is calling us to account here. He is calling us to a kind of faith that will ask a lot of us, but that will also give us far more than we can even imagine. And fortunately, my friends, we get to be in it together. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. On behalf of the Stewardship Committee, I'm here today to report to you the results of the 2021 Stewardship Campaign. As you will recall, the theme of this year's campaign was our children, our community, our commitment. In keeping with this theme, we highlighted the many ways in which this congregation cares for and nurtures not only its own youngest members, but also youth throughout the greater Morristown area. 
Living our faith through action is at the core of stewardship. And in a remarkable year, you showed once again that this church lives its faith, not only by what we say, but by what we do. The 2021 campaign was divided into two components, the annual stewardship campaign and a separate piece, a direct outreach for youth scholarships to be administered by the Morris Education Foundation for two specific summer programs, Summer Plus and the Summer Music Academy. These programs, which benefit Morris youth both within and beyond our congregation, boost students' skills and confidence and assure their parents that their children are in a safe and healthy environment. For the 2021 Stewardship Campaign, you have pledged over $815,000. This is an extraordinary result in a difficult time, with the average annual pledge for those who did pledge actually increasing over last year. For the Summer Scholarship Program, to date we have received donations totaling over $70,000. We are in the process of planning a celebration of this great achievement and a presentation of this money to the Morris Education Foundation with more details to be forthcoming as our plans crystallize. We want to arrange appropriate publicity, not only to highlight our churches, your accomplishment, but also to encourage other Morristown congregations to undertake similar efforts for this and other equally meritorious community programs. And don't forget, it's never too late to give, which can be done either through the church website or by contacting the church office. Thank you. And now we take a moment to thank God for the many gifts that God has given to us. Today, we gladly and wholeheartedly return to God our gifts of resources, of talent, of time. May those gifts serve to bring forth peace, justice, and flourishing in God's most beloved world. Amen. Trusting in God's promises, let us pray for the world and for our needs. Let us pray. God, you blessed Abraham and Sarah and promised to make them the ancestors of many nations. In Jesus Christ, you have opened your covenant to everyone who lives by faith in you. We pray that all of the descendants of Abraham and Sarah would dwell together in peace and be a sign of your abiding love. Holy God, hear our prayer. Holy One, your beloved Son, Jesus, called disciples to follow his way of sacrificial love. We pray for all pastors and teachers and church leaders that they lead the church in humble example, take up their cross in faithful service and live for the sake of the gospel. Holy God, hear our prayer. Holy God, your reign encompasses all the world, though many do not remember or acknowledge your gracious Lordship for peace among the nations and for integrity within governments so that your will be done on earth as in heaven. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you hear the cries of poor people and you satisfy the hungry with good things. We pray for those who are poor, who are downtrodden, that they may find deliverance. We pray for all who live to serve the poor and who seek to alleviate human misery. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you know the needs of those who are suffering and you hear their cries. We pray for those who suffer illness of body, mind or circumstance. May they find relief from suffering and be restored to wholeness. We pray today for those who struggle with COVID-19 and its aftermath. 
We pray for those who mourn. We take a moment to pray in the silence to lift up the names closest to our hearts. Holy God, hear our prayer. Grant these prayers, Holy God, by your grace. Stir up in us the will to seek out your reign with the dedication of our lives in ministry to the world for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, through whom we pray and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching, marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of the light of God. We are marching. Marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of God. See a home, a cook on your grand course. See a home, a cook on your grand course. See a home, a cook on your grand course. See a home, a cook on your grand course. See a home, a home, see a home. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who bore the cross for us, and the love of God, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>